Hurken ook het trap sans een trap sans een trap sans trap sans een trap don't sans trap don't sans trap toen is sans de hoek je hem door potlaan daar is tot aan door potlaan voor het daar Bueno. Is this Big Sexy? Hey, what's up? You ever best can answer the phone? How are you, man? I'm doing all right. How you doing? Good. How was your weekend? Uh, it wasn't bad, man. <laughs> um, wasn't bad. Are we on now? Yep. Okay. I want to say, man, um, I want to say before uh, we got started uh, on anything that um, if I talk slow know. or anything... Uh, on this one, if I sound slow, it's not that I'm drunk. Well, I am drunk, but that's not why. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I listened back to the last uh, the last time I was on, and I talk so fast sometimes I like sound like an auctioneer on cocaine. And uh, <laughs> I would never want anyone to think you know badly of me like that. I would ever be an auctioneer. So um, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression of me. But uh, no, I really do. Me and Max Mitrione seem to always have a, a contest who can talk the fastest on a podcast. So I'm trying I'm, to. Dude, I'm right there with pop. you, man. You know how many times, like, like I've told, I've been on stage telling a joke, and I'm like, I thought that was funny, and people were like, "What?" Especially like if I'm in, like in the Midwest or down south or even older people, like I'm like, man, if I just would have given it a little bit more time, I would have gotten a laugh. That happened. Yeah. I, that's like the story of my of like my life. I think it's for me because my family. Nobody listens to each other at all. We cut each other off all the time. Right. So if you didn't talk fast, you were not going to get heard. <laughs> right. You know? so, yeah, mine's probably just the cocaine. But, <laughs> no, By I'm the way, I like an, 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 not just an auctioneer, an auctioneer on cocaine. I, I can't, like, as if it's not bad enough being an auctioneer, right, auctioneer yeah. on cocaine. And by I've the way, you have tried, been using... uh, I've never tried cocaine, uh, fortunately. Um, I've always stayed away from it. Uh, I normally pronounce it cocaina because I've worked for face so many times. But uh, I've actually never uh, never tried it. A girl warned me once I knew that uh, he used to be hooked on it. She said it was, uh, she said cocaine is like, uh, compared to the first time you ever had sex with, you know, seven years old. When you were seven years old, it was Christmas morning. And I said, man, I know, I told her I know exactly what that feels like because I did have sex when I was seven years old on Christmas morning. So. <laughs> Did you really? No, I'm just joking. That would be weird, oh. and probably uh, cause for <laughs> dude. Uh, law dude, you have the funniest. You have the funniest ethics I've ever heard in my life. Like your ethics are so funny. Like it's like you won't do cocaine, but you'll take 19 different kinds of steroids, right? And then, and then well, like, and then. I guess if I've never seen it. We would performance enhancing. Then I guess that would be a possible uh, scenario. So. And then I've never seen a guy do more, um, bang more, like like strippers, like girls, crazy, blah blah blah. Like I mean, you just like, you. I remember the first time I met you. Like if you come to Indiana, I will have every slut in Indiana come to your show, right? right. And then, but but then you'll break up with the girl if she goes to a nightclub. Right. And it's like. <laughs> like <laughs> I am a uh, what is it? A uh, riddle wrapped inside. Something I don't know what it's called. God, I blew it's that one. So, uh, what does that say? It's so it's it's so it's that you have, you have your own code of ethics, is what it is. Like you have. I really your, do. <laughs> yeah, one yeah, thousand percent. But then, but then also you um, somebody was like start picking a fight with you the other day, and online, and you said that he fell out of his mom's womb and right onto the to the uh, spectrum, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, I oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, that was off the top of my head too. It just there was you could tell there was something wrong with that with that guy. <laughs> just by the just by attempting to have a fight with me online, he was obviously retarded. But uh no one can you can so I'm still unseated on the internet after all these years. I can't be beaten. It's uh well new, one of my one of my favorite uh things is when people try to pick fights with you online, they don't realize that you will go to the throat. Like you don't care. And then yeah. they go, hey, I'm just kidding. We're friends, right? And you're like, no, we're not friends. And then you're like, but hey, is it's kind of even. No, it's not even. <laughs> like, right. Like, it's not it's... over. It will never be over. What happens is they always, uh, they'll try to, people will try to slide in like a jab at me, um, like something really personal, you know, like about my kids or something. And then I'll, I'll send them a direct message. I'll be like, hey, I'll give you the opportunity to, uh, to delete that or whatever. If not, I'm going to really hurt your feelings, you know, and I don't want to do that. Like I tell them, I always send them like a message. 
privately, like, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to have you, like, cry about it or whatever. Like, you really should probably delete that. Like, I don't know you like that. We're not friends. You should don't say stuff about my kids. I mean, I don't want anybody saying stuff about my kids anyway, but certainly not if I don't know you. Uh, and it wasn't a funny joke, you know? And then they're like, uh, you don't scare me. Do your best. I'm like, you really don't want it. I promise. You don't want me to do that. And then they keep at it, and then I end up devastating them. And then they start cussing me out, saying they're going to kill me, and then they block me all within 20 minutes every time because I just immediately can go to their I go to their Facebook page, and then I'll find someone they look like a retarded version of, like or like their kid looks like, um, you know, so this or that. And I'll start putting it on there and start putting comparison pictures, you know, of uh, how their son looks like uh, a, a troll in some movie or whatever. And then um, they get all offended. Up. They usually threaten me to kill me, like they're going to kill me, and then they block me. But then I, I claim victory and try to find some other form of social media to contact them on to continue the beating. No, dude, it's brutal. And I, it, it's brutal, dude. You're so. It, I mean, I wouldn't want to fuck with you online. Like, I don't fuck with you. I mean, you're like, you're my friend, but like, I'm a professional comedian. I'm like, dude, this. You're one of those guys that, like, I'm like, nothing is off limits with this dude. Like, you know? But, but you're right, though. It's, it, it's always. You never are the guy starting the fight, ever. No. It's always I mean, somebody starting with you. That's what will happen. Someone will say something to me that I would never say to them. You know, that's what will happen. Someone will say something to me, and I'm like, Wow, I would never just randomly go on someone's page and say that about them personally, someone I didn't know. And maybe they feel like they know me because they've been following me online or something like that. But um, they'll say, I mean, I had a guy the other day say something like, I made a joke about something, and he was like, uh, yeah, well, um, he said something, and I sent a message like, hey, I, I don't want you talking about my kids, this and that, or whatever. And so he immediately goes back and says something about, yeah, I can't wait till my son's banging your daughter in two years or whatever. I, he goes, I can't wait to see that. And I'm like, why would you want to see that? You want to watch your kid have sex with somebody? That's weird. And then uh, yeah. warned him again. I was like, dude, seriously, stop. I'm going to hurt your feelings. Like, just warned him, you know, privately again. And he went after it. And then I'm so, I just kept on and kept on and kept on. And I had, before long, everyone starts following the thread. Like, people start joining in, tagging. So he checks us out. And he gets pretty brutal sometimes. But sadly, I never feel well, People don't realize like, that, I really like, don't. Maybe I'm a like, sociopath, but I don't. Uh, I was always the guy who, if someone's sitting my food, let's say, like at a restaurant, and I stabbed them, I wouldn't feel bad. I feel like that's what you get. You know, like, you know, like you wouldn't have spit in my food, it wouldn't have happened. Um, but I never go looking for trouble, ever. Like, never wanted to be a bully, never wanted to uh, actually abhor bullies, as you've seen in person before, when guys try to, those guys over in Illinois try to bully that one little dirty kid or whatever. Like, I, I, I can't stand bullies, but uh, I love being the one to straighten them out. But, uh, yeah, once people mess with me, I, I give them a warning and they get one. And after that, that's, that's the end of it. So. No, dude, seriously, like, you are one of the nicest guys I know, and uh, you're a very, very loyal friend. Like, I think you drove, like, five hours to come to see my comedy show one time. Like, you're one of those dudes that, like, if you don't like somebody, no matter how famous or whatever, you don't care. But no. if you like somebody, no matter, no matter how much society deems them, like, unimportant, you're like, no, I like that person. That's my friend. You're very, uh, but your whole career, which you don't give yourself enough credit. I mean, how many guys could beat Mark Hunt in 49 seconds? And how many guys could accomplish what you have? But one of the funniest stories about you is when, when you were trying to get into the UFC and you would take pictures of like what you next to Mitrione or something, and you'd be yeah. like 10 times the size of him. Like what? What exactly was that story again? Well, I had uh, I created such a larger than life uh, persona online. You know, I would say I could run a 4-2-40, and then someone would say I could, and I would bet them $50,000 I could, but they had to put the money up front. I was always getting people to back down. Obviously, I couldn't do the things I claimed I could do 99% of the time, but um, I would always claim I could do something. And so then uh, when we started taking pictures, like with Matt Mitrione, I would stand on something to make myself like 8 or 10 inches taller, so it looked like I was, you know, seven six or something. And uh, I, in every picture, I would always make sure I was way taller than everybody. And so, like, the first time I met Ben Rothwell, he goes, I thought you were supposed to be, like, 7'2 or 7'3. And I was like, I never claimed that. He said, yeah, but every picture I saw, he goes, you're like my height. But it was so funny because uh, I would always uh, just troll people, making them think that I was – anything they talked about, I claimed. Like, someone one time was talking to me for a picture. It was a pretty good portrait. And I was like uh, – I told him I could have done better. You know, it's on the underground. They're like, oh, yeah, I bet. And I was like, you've not seen any of my work. And I started just stealing people's work off, you know, the Internet and posting as if it were mine, photoshopping my signature on it and things like that. So my whole uh, my whole persona was supposed to be like Ric Flair in the 80s mixed with uh, The Rock in the 90s, like the early 90s, you know, or whatever. Um, so I was only just doing it for fun because I really liked it. <laughs> and I had kind of retired back then, so I had entirely too much time on my hands. So after I sold my business, so I just like to troll people online. And sometimes it's been hours a day doing it, which... Didn't say much for my life, but uh, I was also married to an evil woman at the time. It was my only escape. 
So um, well, I gotta say, I mean, your, your your girl now is is drop dead gorgeous, but some of the women before her, oh my god, <laughs> and uh, like the pictures you would show me, I was like, they, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a more consistent group of tens in my life. Yeah, the insane. funny thing was, well, the funny thing was, two people would always act like, oh yeah, anybody can just. Um, I, I actually had a girl one time. It was funny. A girl I was had dated that I just liked her. I mean, she was it wasn't bad looking, but I just. Uh, I just kind of liked her personality, you know, and so she ended up getting on my nerves, so I cut her loose, just texted her, told her, okay, we'll lose my number, because she got mouthy with me, and she goes, well, good luck ever doing better than me, and I'm like, I'm sure I'll be fine, and uh, she's like, no, seriously, I would love to see the last couple girls you dated before me, I'm sure they were real, you know, winners, and I was like, I can promise you, you don't want to see the last couple girls I dated before you, like, I can promise you, you don't want that, she just kept at it and at it, well, so while she was still talking shit to me, I made a collage, of the last 10 girls I dated, you know, and uh, I sent her a collage with a little guy. I don't know. He's a rapper or somebody. Uh, there's a real famous meme where there's a rapper that says, you mad. He's like smiling real big, pointing at the uh, pointing at the camera. And so I made a, him in the middle with a collage of women surrounding um, him that I had dated. And the girl goes like, she texts me back. She goes, oh, my gosh, I'm so sure. Because I told her, I said, well, how about the last couple? What about the last 10 I dated? And sent her the picture. She goes, oh, I'm so sure anybody can. Uh, go to Instagram, find a bunch of models, like Instagram models that aren't famous, and take their pictures and make a collage out of it. And um, she goes, look, I used to date The Rock. And she sends me a picture of him. And she goes, I used to date Channing Tatum. She sends me a picture of him. She goes, it's real easy. And I was like, well, I can't really prove what I'm saying. I don't know how I can prove it. She's like, exactly, because it didn't happen, douchebag. And I said, well, I told her, and by this time, I'm still making another collage, right? Because I know we're, I'm giving a little time between each text. And I said, I guess you're right. Other than if I did date him, how do you explain this? And sent her the same collage with the guy in the middle saying you mad, but with me and a picture with each girl I had dated, like in the same spot in the collage. So like one sitting on my lap, one giving me a kiss on the cheek, which I might say that my current girlfriend was in that collage. So she made first page collage. (laughs) It's pretty impressive. I tell her all the time that uh, she does have to feel insecure because she was first page collage, which she doesn't really like. But um, yeah, I, uh, (laughs) Sent her that, and the girl, uh, she didn't say anything to me for three days, and then she finally sent me a text back that said, uh, I don't know why you ever wasted your time with me. I can't compete with that. And uh, I felt kind of bad, and I thought about it, so I just sent her back one and said, yep, me neither. And uh, oh, that, wow. was we, that was how we left it. Nice. Dude, the li- dude, the things that, like, the, the screenshots you used to send me with you and girls were, like, the things you would say to people, and I'm like, why? I'm like, what is going on? Like, like they were... <laughs> <laughs> I, I still would love to turn that into a book one day. The, uh, that's when I hated women. Like, I uh, back in the day, I got to where I really, you know, how like how much Ronald McDonald hates men. Um, I had yeah. gotten to the point where I hated women that much. So, like, maybe not as much. Like, I guess there's degrees. Like, the highest degree, the Rosie O'Donnell degree for a man is probably like the guy who has the serial killer man who goes around and you know kidnaps women and kills them because he hates his mom deep down or something like that. So right. um, I was probably like one stage, not quite that far. I was like one stage like behind. So I was like maybe the guy behind the camera in a porn movie who's like, oh, yeah, choker, choker, like the real aggressive guy who really hates women, it seems like, for some reason. Um, I was like at that guy's level of hating women. So that was a good joke. But anyway, that said, um, <laughs> I, uh, that said, I got to a point where I didn't want to even date anybody. And this is why I was still, you know, people talk on USC. I didn't want to date anybody. So I would just see how quickly I could get rid of a girl who I had met or who had messaged me, or maybe I was talking to him. Uh, and so I would just send him the most ridiculous things ever, you know, or whatever. Um, this girl was like, uh, I mean, I have screenshots still of all of them. But it would be, I would always screenshot it the last time they communicated with me. Like one off the top of my head was a girl that said, uh, I said, are you still working at such and such place? She goes, no. And I said, why not? And she said, uh, really poor management. They're all idiots. And I said, well, they never should have made you a manager to begin with. <laughs> uh, and uh you know she's just stopped responding at that point so i would screenshot it and i have a couple hundred of them i wanted to turn into a, a book one day i don't know if anybody else yeah but then they were like they were like molested they were like molested jokes and like incest jokes in there it was like it's like race jokes some of the things i was just like oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, i had some good ones back in the day oh my like, god they were hilarious I, I told a girl one time that she was i said ask her how old she was and uh she said 19, and I said, oh, that's the same. That's my type. And she goes, really? I said, yeah, only three years too old. And uh, Oh, my God. Yeah, she never responded. So <laughs> apparently she thought I wanted to date a 16-year-old. Yeah, it's supposed to be funny. 
A couple of them did respond though. They were like, "Ah, oh, hi, you just you're so funny or something." And then you would make it worse. I right. was like, "Oh." Um, <laughs> I was like like you would you would like double down and I'm like, "Oh, um, but the, but the but the girl that you're currently with, your your, your girlfriend, she she like gets you though." She so, what? I can hear you. She she gets you. Oh, you know, yeah, like she definitely, she definitely does, man. She's awesome. She, uh, she, I, I couldn't chase her away with anything offensive. Like, uh, when I first met her, she, I thought it was hilarious. So I would say stuff like that to her when I was uh, texting her and uh, stuff, and she always got the joke. So we have, uh, we definitely have the same sense of humor, which helps a lot, especially if you're trying to date someone like me, which it would have to be nightmarish at, at certain points, I would think. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Like, my wife will be sleeping, and I'll, like, whisper in her ear. I'll be like, anal sex, you know? And then she'll, and then she'll whisper back, turn over. And I'm like, yeah, that's my wife. You know, yeah. us, of course. <laughs> Sounds about right. I love yeah, your wife, yeah. man. She's awesome. I, uh, I've met her, I think, what, four or five times now, and uh, yeah, the sweetest we girl out. you could ever want to meet, man. I was, uh, I was a little nervous, you know, when you first met her, because you, uh, you guys got married pretty quick, right? Yeah, we got married real well. We got engaged real quick because like, I got her, I got her pregnant after like two months, and oh, then yeah, she was like, "I'm not gonna keep the baby, or I'm only gonna have the baby if like if, if if we're married." And then she had a miscarriage, and I was like, "Uh," but I was like, "Nah, she's the one." So, um, yeah. Now, by the way, uh, at my wedding, I never asked you about this, right? So, like, you were sitting next to Scott Bayo, and, right? Thankfully, and. And and you said and and you were like debating whether you should say something to him. I I could see you debating, but I didn't see you hit him. Then on your Facebook, you said you went up to him and you said, "Hey, Chachi," or like, "Who's in charge?" or something. Oh or, no, it was did, uh, no. We um, me and my girlfriend were um, we've been arguing that entire weekend. And sometimes when you travel, man, it was she was came up from San Diego. She was living there to go to that wedding. I come out and picked her up, and it, you know how Facebook is awesome at starting drama. Like, who is this girl liking your picture? And I'm like, well, who's this guy liking yours? And it started, you know, on the way to the wedding, right? On our two and a half hour drive or three hour drive from San Diego, and uh, so we were fighting there all night. And I was kind of in a bad mood by the time I got there, just because we've been fighting, and I just I hate fighting at events like that or on vacations. It's like I just want to break. I guess be nice at least during this. We'll save fighting for a different time. But we had been fighting, and uh, so it was getting even almost uncomfortable at the table because we were saying something back and forth to each other. So I said, let's go, you know, we we're going out. You had like a beautiful venue there, but they had an area out back where the, uh, there was, I don't know, it was like a castle in that place, but they had a place where the restrooms were and like a little, uh, entertainment hall or something. I said, come back here and talk. I don't want to do argue in front of people, you know? So we go back there. It's just kind of me and her standing back there uh, in this area. And we're going back and forth arguing. It kind of gets more and more heated to where I was glad we weren't in front of people. And then around the corner comes Scott Mayo. Um, as he's walking around, um, and I hadn't I hadn't seen him yet since we've been there. I was like, "Holy crap, that's Scott Bayo!" You know, because this happens early on in the, in the uh, reception. It's like it's Scott Bayo, and uh, so we're arguing, and she can't see him. Uh, like my girlfriend can't see him. Only I can see him. And he's he can he can tell he's a little concerned. Like he's looking at us as he's walking by. Like, are you guys physically fighting back here or what? Because I was kind of like being loud, you know, yelling at her. And uh, he kind of looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, "Charles, would you mind helping us out here?" Because, uh, I don't know, it just seemed like the thing to say. And he just looked at me like he had no idea what I was talking about. And I thought that would break the, uh, I thought that would break the tension with my girlfriend, but she's too young to know what, she, what Charles in charge was. So I was like, that was Scott Bale, you know, from Charles in charge. And she's like, what? And I was like, Charles. Dude, I got my... She was like, what? Dude. So she didn't know about happy days either. So uh, I explained Dude, it baby... to her. And then we had a good rest of the time. So My baby's sleeping on me right now, but I want to just die laughing, but then she'll wake up. But that's oh, hilarious. Yeah. You don't want that. So, so you know, that is that is absolutely hilarious. Now you are a big comedy fan, and I keep telling you to do stand up comedy because I think you would murder it out there. Have you seen any good comics lately that you want to talk about? Or oh yeah, um, I like this new guy. Um, actually, a couple. Um, I love Theo Vaughn, which a lot of people don't know who he is yet. I don't think yeah. he's just now getting on. They maybe know him from Joe Rogan's podcast. But uh, I did happen to see. I was watching a, a podcast uh, today, actually. And uh, Brendan Schaub said that uh, he's always wanted to be a stand-up comic since he was seven years old. That was always the plan. He literally said it on the Impulsive uh, podcast. He said he's always uh, he's always wanted to be a stand-up comic. It was always his goal. And uh, fighting in sports was just a means to an end to get him to be a stand-up comic, which was ironic because I remember him saying the same thing for years that he always wanted to be an NFL player. And he never dreamed he would get into comedy. Um, but he said at seven years old, his dad told him, listen, you need to give up these stand-up comedy dreams. You're too athletic and too big to be wasting your time around. You need to be a pro athlete, like his dad said, which 
kind of think that's probably the best advice anyone ever gave him because if you've seen his stand up, he probably should have just picked the football or fight him. But uh, <laughs> he put out a uh, he put out a recent uh, he put out a recent clip of his stand up, which he someone has added in a laugh track for him. Um, it's the it's the most ridiculous. I, I start sending people like, "Is this funny at all? Tell me, am I just am I just a hater? Because I don't hate any other comedian. Like I don't uh, like I can't think of anybody I don't like. I, like I don't think Larry the Cable Guy's funny. I got a funny story about him, uh, but I don't think Larry the Cable Guy's funny. But I don't. I, that, whatever, two other people maybe is. So, um, I send it to people, and I'm like, uh, Schaub's idea of stand up comedy is to be like, uh, anyone see this Michael Jackson thing? What the fuck? Hey, did anybody hear about this Jesse Smollett thing? What the fuck's up with that? Hey, did anybody, any, like, there's no punchline. It's just like, it reminds me of Cliff on uh, Cheers. I don't know if you ever saw that episode where his punchline and everything is just, what's up with that? Like, that's his punchline oh, for yeah. everything. And uh, yeah. so it's like, the, if you go to the comment section um, on Shop, Shop's thing, it's like the most brutal 99% people are like, this is supposed to be funny. What is going on here? Like, this guy has a Showtime special, like this and that. And it's not even, you, I don't even hate on a guy for trying something or going after something, taking advantage. I don't care. But the part that kills me is he actually thinks like, he's like, yeah, I was, I was between Chappelle and uh, Eddie Murphy last night, you know, at the comedy store, you know, that's, that's a little tough, you know, to, to keep the crowd going between those two. And, uh, you know, and, you know, they, do you think, doubt, do you think uh, they asked someone asked about Blake like... Griffin trying stand up comedy and he, they were like, who do you think is better at stand up? Uh, you're Blake Griffin. He was like, bro, are you kidding me? I've sold out shows all over the country. Blake Griffin's an amateur. He needs to stick to his jump shot. Like, dude, are you kidding? Like, are you kidding? Wow, like, really? He problem. said that? That's why well, I've never liked Shab. Even things in the UFC. Like, I mean, when I was in the UFC, I knew about where I stood. You know, like, I trained with really good dudes. I know that if Jake O'Brien beats me up in practice um, and Cain Velasquez beat Jake O'Brien in a minute and a half, that I'm probably not going to do very well with Cain Velasquez. Like, I, I'm, I'm a realist, you know? Like, I can be honest with myself. Right. Um, you watch The Ultimate Fighter and Shab two fights into his into his fight career and Trevor Whitman's telling him, you know you're the best in the world, right? And Shaw's like, hell yeah, I am. Like, really? You, you really are? Like, you believe that two fights in, you're the best in the world? And confidence is great, but there's a thin line between confidence and being completely delusional. So that's what I, I just feel like. Like, they asked him on that, uh, they asked him on that podcast, has he read any good books lately? He's like, well, I'm reading the history of the comedy store. I'm reading uh, Robin Williams' biography. I'm reading... Um, you know, all the people, all my heroes, I'm reading there, there's the Betty Murphy's biography, you know, Dave Chappelle's biography, you know, all the guys I've always looked up to my whole life. Like your whole life, does that consist of just when Rogan talked you out of fighting anymore? Cause that's when you became a stand up comic. So like I said, maybe I'm not jealous do you think cause he's... I don't want to be a comedian. Like I like to make people laugh, but I would rather write comedy than perform it. But, uh, like I said, maybe I'm just being a hater, but I just, I don't know. I, I can't stand when. I didn't like Sean on the Ultimate Fighter, but I liked Roy Nelson. And Roy Nelson is every bit as confident as anybody in the world when it comes to his fighting, but Roy can back it up. Like, he has the, you know, skill to pay the bills, as they say. That rhymed unintentionally. But, uh, yeah, Shop's comedy, if you haven't seen it, um, I suggest you watch it or just uh, watch Dave Chappelle's mannerisms that he stole because he hits, he hits the microphone on his thigh every time he tells a joke. He gets laughing at his own joke in the middle of it. Like, the Michael Jackson joke, he laughed four or five times for five, six seconds each time, just at himself. He couldn't get the joke out. And I'm like, dude, I, I know that the Santa Comics tell the same joke a thousand times. It didn't make you laugh that hard the 997 times, you know? So, like I said, can't hate on a guy for going out and taking advantage of what he's given or anything like that. It's just, let's talk reality and don't go out bragging about your Showtime special that you wouldn't have if it weren't with Joe Rogan. Let's be honest. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the podcast. I mean, he didn't have to really go... Obviously, do it the the standard way, and you know, a lot of times I think he's just telling stories that he told on his podcast on stage to his podcast fans, you know. But you know, also a lot of times it's it's not the first hour that you have; it's the second hour, you know. Right, right. But, but he but he's also like a master of like lowering expectations. Right. So I wonder if he did that on purpose. Like he he put out a tape that. He wasn't. He didn't. He didn't think was that great. So then, everyone, and then and then his special is that much better. Like right. maybe. <laughs> well, but, I'll tell you what. He's... I'll tell you what for sure. I'll give him credit for, and I really do. I mean this with all sincerity. He is definitely a master at hooking his wagon to the right, you know, horse or whatever. Like the Theo Vaughn guy is really funny on podcasts. All of a sudden, Sean has a podcast with Theo Vaughn. Um, you know, like being on Rogan as much as you can. Like if you were on Joe Rogan as much as. 
Britain and Schaub was, you would have five Showtime specials. Like you personally, I'm saying, would have them by now, you know, or whatever. Yeah, I know. Um, I just, it, that's just not me. I, you know, I, I can't pretend to be friends. Not that I'm not friends with Joe Rogan, but I just, I'm not one of those guys that's going to hang out and then hopefully to be accepted into some kind of clique. And I'm just not one of those guys that just hangs out at clubs if I'm not booked at them. You know, I, I'd rather work on my craft and eventually it's going to take me a longer road, but at least I'll get there on my own merit. You know, versus like aligning yourselves with people who are successful and then hoping that their success rubs up to your success. But hey, look, it's work. It's working for him, so you can't say it's not working for him. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't blame for that. It's just uh, like what? Or what are you going to do to sell yourself out? To that's what I was never willing to do, man. I I wouldn't go. Uh, I wouldn't move when my kids were little. When I was trained to fight, I would have been much better off going out and training out extreme couture's or going out and training at Jackson's or something. Um, but my kids, I had joint custody of them and my son would beg me. Well, if I left for three or four days, my son would be like, dad, please take me with you. Please let me go. Not necessarily because his mom was a terrible person. I mean, she is, but not, uh, not because, uh, that wasn't why necessarily. I'm just joking, but kind of, um, but she, um, but my son would beg me and I used to tell him, Hey, if I had to be gone for like four or five weeks, could you do that? My son was like seven, six at the time. He'd be like, you dad, or, you know, dad, please go, please just take me with you. You know, and I, I never, I wasn't willing to trade that hurting him to be a better fighter. You know, I was like, I'll just do the best with what I can. Um, the same way, like I, I would very likely never uh, make it being famous or in Hollywood or anything because I'm not going to teach people to, to, to do it or have sleep with, you, you also, know. And you also have morals. I mean, you're a guy who doesn't cheat on your wife. You don't fuck your friends over. You don't, I, I'm not saying Shaub does. I, ha, I have no idea right. about his personal life, but I'm just saying that I know you are a person with convictions and, a lot of times, you know, there are people that are not like that. They're willing to, you know, sell their firstborn to get as far as they as they they can in their career wise. But, you know, yeah, you know, Hollywood's a it's it's a, it's a roller coaster. And I could I could name 10, 20, 30, 50 people that were like the hottest thing in the in show business, and then all of a sudden they weren't, and right. because they didn't have the actual the art form and they didn't have the craft. I mean, look at fighters. How many fighters have we seen all of a sudden? They're like, "This is the next big thing," and then they're not, you know? Right. It, because it, it they get it goes, man. And um, if you don't, uh, if you're not, you know, Spelling, where you're, you know, like, uh, like Shab, I, I heard Shab call himself the CM Punk of comedy, which I thought that was a pretty good analogy. Except CM Punk can fight. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but <sighs> um, I thought, uh, I, I like more like Tory Spelling more so than CM Punk. Like the two, you know, that kept like they said that Tory Spelling went in an audition for. I'm showing my age right now, but for Beverly Hills 90210, oh, she auditioned over under a fake name. Like, yeah, I'm sure she wouldn't have gotten yeah. the role, you know, uh, either way. Of like, course. Yeah, yeah but she knows show, that, you know, though. Like, 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 Tori knows that, know. though. Yeah. So it's up. Uh, I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't fault people for taking advantage of stuff. It's just like, let, just like, let's be honest about how you got where you are. Let's not say, you know, um, like you didn't like in Shop's case, you didn't want to be a stand-up comic from the time you were seven. Like that never happened. You never said that until you became a stand-up comic. Never heard you say it in a million interviews I've watched. I used to watch guys' interviews all the time. Um, I guarantee you, like I get told on a weekly basis that I should try stand-up comedy by ever any time. Even the comics, you know, that I met when I would go to your shows back, I would be back there telling about when I met R. Kelly or some ridiculous story. And they'd be like, why don't you do stand-up comedy? I was like, gosh, oh, so much travel. You know, I so said, I don't, I don't like to be away from my kids, you know, and, um, stuff like that. I hate being in front of crowds. I would like to write. I just don't like to do it. But I, I guarantee you, Shab didn't get told that twice or three times in his entire life. Like, who watched The Ultimate Fire when Shab was on? Thought, that guy should try stand-up comedy. Nobody. Like, it didn't happen. No, you but know? I think that, I think, honestly, sometimes people, like, like, uh, I, I know my big, one of my biggest problems with auditions was I, I overthink, you know, and, like, I, I take myself out of the game. I like worry too much. I panic. I have anxiety attacks. And by the time I get there, it's like I fucked myself up. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. But yeah. like Shalb's one of those dudes where it's like almost like believing your own hype and like ignorance is bliss, I think, in some ways. It is. Where... No, it absolutely is. <laughs> uh, it can be that way in fighting, too. Like when, uh, when, I, when I was undefeated still, and Monty Cox was my agent, he, you know, he used to manage five of the six UFC champions. Um, after I lost my first fight, he said, listen, you need to make sure this doesn't what, um happened to you or what happens to other guys that have happened to you and he said and i was like what's that he goes most guys when they're undefeated start to believe they can't be beaten you know like like even if they're getting beaten but god will intervene somehow or something will happen they'll, they'll, i'll find a way to pull it out i'll win you start becoming delusional and i actually did when i beat hunt and then i almost submitted strew a minute in i was like i cannot believe this is this easy you know like as i was getting ready to submit strew i remember thinking i cannot believe i'm about to submit him 
and be 2-0 and in the UFC and 12-0 and overall, you know, or whatever. And, um, of course, I didn't submit him that he punched me in the face 100 times, but th- there is definitely something to be said for that confidence that comes. You know, a lot of guys, if you watch any boxer, Tyson or anybody else, after they lose the first time, they're never the same. Or you watch basketball players or football players, after they tear their ACL or their Achilles tendon, they're never the same again. They could get just as fast again, just as quick, just as agile, but they're never mentally. There's something there, you know? And uh, I really do. I'm, I'm a firm believer in if you're delusional like that, it, it, I mean, it can hurt you, and it, but it can definitely help you too, you know, because uh, that confidence comes through. And even if it's, uh, even if it's misplaced or unwarranted confidence, uh, it can help. Yeah, but you're, I don't know man, if it's I'm so, not just I don't know if it's being... You are the least Hollywood guy I've ever met that lives out in Hollywood. You know what I mean? As far as like, uh, um, I typically don't like people like that. I've known a lot of people that were famous or semi-famous. And uh, usually um, once they're done with you, what they can get from you, you never hear from them again. They don't return text. You don't talk to them. Uh, I don't want to call any UFC uh, commentator, not commentators, uh, any uh, MMA uh, broadcasters or journalists out, but there were certain ones that were my best friend when I was the hottest thing in the UFC. I mean, it hit me up weekly. Hey, how you doing? Just checking on you. Uh, how's this going, that and this and that, and so I get cut. I don't even get a call back. I don't get a return text. And I'm like, you know, at some point I'm like, uh, I thought we were friends. Like maybe I'm retarded, but I thought we were friends. You know, like I really, literally no, did. That's, that's, or they that's write a, like a, they that. write a hit piece on me when I fight uh, the Pujanowski guy over there. I beat him the first time. Second time, I can make a hundred excuses, but he ends up beating me by decision. And they're like writing a, an article about me about like what a joke the fight was, what a joke my career's become. The fight was obviously fixed. You know, blah blah blah. And I'm like, okay, like, like, no, you're getting personal with me, attacking me just to get a few more views by writing some controversial win. It wasn't like, like light spirited kidding or joking. Like you're actually trying to make me look bad now just to get people to do that. And I was under the impression until that happened, he and I were friends, you know? So, uh, but no, once, Ariel, you know, I moved dude, down, Ariel I moved up, I mean, he doesn't know my name anymore, you know? No, Ariel Hawani is one of those dudes. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying he's going to rhyme with that. No, man, there are so many guys, like, there are so many guys out there, and I know who they are that, like, tomorrow, which could happen if all of a sudden I get a TV show, HBO says we're doing the Adam Hunter show. These guys that didn't talk to me for ten years are, are like, right. Are, right. they were all like, they're they're like professional dick riders, is what they are, you know. <laughs> and then, um, and then and then they then they show up and they basically eat everything off your plate. And then they leave and they go for the next person. And right. but you can't, I can't worry about those people. All I have to know is those people. I have to know though that like, because there's a part of me. That that is like that. I'm like, dude, wait till I get my fucking show. I'm not helping out any of these guys. You know, like there is that. I tell myself that it's like that that scene in Batman when uh and like the the, the one where he's like he's like holding the guy, the guy that like trained him, and he's like, I don't have to. I'm not gonna kill you, but I don't have to save you. That was one of like my favorite lines. Right. And like these and I, and I and like same thing. I'm not gonna be a dick to you, but I'm not gonna save you because I know a guy who was one of the biggest comics in the world. And he, he was getting trashed by everybody. All the alternative comics that you know were just taking shots at the guy left and right. So he started calling people into his movie, having them read for his movie, and then telling them to go fuck themselves after their audition. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. He must have read the Donald yeah, Trump but, book on a Get but, Even. But, but then it really backfired on him because then he became the, one of the least... Guys, so it's like you can't let that. You know, it's like you kind of have to just do it to yourself. You know what I'm saying? It's like you, because a part of me was like, "That's awesome, good for him." But then, you know, you could, you could, you could really fuck yourself by doing that too. You just yeah. have to kind of, you kind of have to just know. But as far as you go, Sean, I mean, the sky's the limit for you, man. Like honestly, like you, I even do your joke. The joke you gave me, I had a threesome one time. It was me, a dude, and a dude. Right? That was that destroys that and, and like you wrote that and you could write jokes like that all day long like it, it's insane you just need the right person behind you you know or the person to give you a shot or you just need to like venture out you know like do your own thing because no, no one's going to help you but 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 once you help yourself once people realize that you don't need them is when they want to do you favors it's right. fucking crazy I mean, yeah. Well, actually, the good news is I actually am starting a podcast within the next two months. I've already got the uh, my camera, my lighting, and everything ordered. I'm gonna do that at my house. I think I'm gonna do a video podcast. I'm gonna start with an audio, uh, but I think I'll be more likely to uh, do it uh, better and more often if it's a, uh, a video one. So I may still go back to audio, but I think right now 
Um, I'm going to stick with the uh, video podcast and start doing that. And uh, I know okay. I'm late on the train getting on, but there's just so many people out there now I see making move, making money doing it. And I'm like, gosh, that guy's not funny at all. And I know a lot of it's, you know, is getting your name out there and getting a start. And the first 200 episodes, probably nobody listened to. But I know every time I come on your show or if I went on a, the MMA hour and roasted fighters or whatever, I get an absolutely ridiculous response. I mean, like, you know, hundreds of people yeah. messaging me, like, why don't you do a podcast? Like, I would listen every week, which maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Um, but I finally, you know, decided I want to uh, – I was talking to my brother about actually my older brother who's, you know, smarter than me about a lot of stuff as far as, uh, I don't know, he's more of a realist, I guess, than I was in a lot of ways. But uh, I talked to him the other day and I said, I used to talk to my dad, but he's dead. Thanks for bringing that up. No, but uh, <laughs> since my dad died, I talked to my uh, older brother and I said, what would you do if you were me? Because I really, I really do want to do something with my life still, you know, um, like I don't want to uh, just sit back and, you know, live off of rental income properties or, you know, making, I, you know, I'm. I buy and sell like uh, stuff and ship it out of the country. Still, <laughs> sound like I was talking about drugs. Uh, but right. no, I uh, in the old business I used to be, and I still do some of that sometimes, where I can you know buy wholesale loads of you know retail merchandise and ship it out of the country. I do that on occasion, uh, make some money here or there. Um, I was going to start flipping houses again, but I asked my brother, I said, "What would you do if you were me?" And he said, uh, "He told me the day said I don't understand why you never wrote a book or tried to do the podcast or tried to stand up or do something like that. They're by far what you're best at." You know, he said, "I don't know why you wouldn't." Like you do that, he says you all the time you do that stuff for free. You, you spend 20, 20 or 30 minutes on a two line Facebook status so it'll get the best laugh, like wording in it, rewording it, you know. He said you're doing that stuff for free all day. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you charge for it? Like, do you know, if you're going to spend that much time writing stuff, try to make people laugh, write a book, and just, you know, with the way things are, you can publish your own stuff now, you know, um, on Amazon, publish your own books. I got a friend that does that. And I think, uh, I, I, yeah, I think I'm going to go that route, man. There was one story I, I always wanted to ask you about where, like, cause I remember somebody on the underground was talking about a guy that, that, that it was a boxer who, like, went out there and then, like, instead of shaking hands, he just walked out of the ring. And then y you said that you were so close to doing that one time. Oh, I yeah. Never I heard was, yeah, no, my, my younger brother came up with an idea because when, when, I, when I thought I was going to fight Mark Hunt, um, I thought it was a joke at first because when I negotiated with the UFC – I turned down their first two money offers, which they couldn't believe. But I was like, I'm not fighting for three thousand dollars, like three and three. You guys are crazy. And uh, so I finally agreed. They gave me eight and eight for my first fight, which still wasn't great. But um, and I said, now my only request is I want to know who I'm fighting before I sign this deal. And they're like, well, we don't know yet. And I said, okay, well, I don't want to get served up to some monster just because I'm a ten and zero, you know, uh, heavyweight. You're going to use one of your guys with a bunch of potential, to make me look bad. You know, like maybe. At that time, I thought, you know, I thought I want to fight Shane Carr when it came to Alaska, uh, who they weren't the, the champ or anything yet. Like Kane was still three or four and or whatever. I think when I signed, um, maybe five. No, I don't know. But I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to be brought in to make someone else look good. I don't, I don't need eight thousand dollars that bad, you know. And they're like, no, it'll be another first time UFC guy. It'll be his first time in the UFC. And so I was like, okay, cool then. I don't need an opponent name, I guess. And you're just putting me in another guy who's you know regional fighter who's worked his way up or whatever. We'll do that. And uh, when I got the uh, contract two weeks later for the bout agreement, it said Mark Hunt. And so I immediately texted my agent and I said, Hey, I just got this bout agreement. That's like Mark Hunt from Iowa or something, right? Like not Mark Hunt, the K1 world champion. Right. And he's like, well, yeah, they, they bought out his contract from pride, but he goes, but if you get him on the ground, you'll be fine. And I was like, but if I don't, I won't be fine. You know? And, uh, he was like, I think you'll be all right. This and that. He goes, listen, he's a big name. If you beat him, you know, he's on a four fight losing streak or whatever it was at the time. I was like, yeah, to Fedor, Alistair Overeem, like the best fighters in the world, you know? And so I went ahead and decided to do it. Might as well go big if I was going to do it at all. So I go ahead and accept the fight. Um, but um, at that time, what were we just talking about? I completely lost my train of thought. There was something I was going to say. You were going to, you were going to leave your gloves in the, oh, the ring story, or like right. walk yeah, out? So, okay, so yeah. The, uh, so I was thinking, um, uh, I, I thought I had a good chance. And the more I talked to everyone around me, everyone thought I was going to get killed. Like everyone, they're just like, dude, you're gonna get murdered. If you can't get him off his feet in the first minute, he's gonna knock you out. And I was like, really? Like I didn't think. Like I thought, I thought people had more confidence in me. I was sure I was gonna win, even in the fight till the first time he hit me. But my little brother came to me with the strategy the day before the fight. He goes, man, I've been thinking about this. He said, like, if you get out there and you just don't feel right, um, you know, he said, like, because I'd never been beaten at that point. He goes, if you just know it's not gonna go your way, either he's too fast, he's too strong, whatever. He says, wait till he like maybe leg kicks you or hits you really hard, like with a body shot or something. And he said, and just scream out like, Oh my God. And take off running, jump over the fence and sprint out of the arena. He said, like sprint up, <laughs> you know, the concourse and out. And he said, I guarantee you, you'll be on every, literally every cable news channel, every sports channel, ESPN, 
Sports Center will be like, you know, stories about the guy who fell running from his opponent and left the arena. And he goes, that'll make you famous enough to get like a Pierre McNeely Pizza Hut deal. You remember when uh, Pierre uh, McNeely knocked himself out with a stuffed crust pizza? Yeah, um, yeah. Or whatever on the commercial. That was my brother. My younger brother's playing. He goes, that's what I would do. Like, he said, if he hit me through a hard leg kick, I'd be like, oh my God, what am I doing? And like, yell it out so everybody can hear. Camera picks it out. He takes off running, jump over the fence and sprint out of the arena. And uh, he said, uh, he said, I guarantee you'll be famous if nothing else. You can probably turn that into something. And uh, I won't say I ever considered it, but uh, it's the uh, first time I Mark had hit me. I thought about it for a split second. I was like, you know, I still could run and get out of here. But, um, that yeah, is so uh, funny. Ended up working out. I'm glad I didn't do it, but that would have been uh, plan B, I guess. That's hilarious, dude. That's hilarious. Uh, if you would have done that, yeah, you would have been like the that would that would have been like the. I don't know though, because like Bob Sapp kind of does stuff like that, similar, and but he doesn't run out of the ring though. Right. Yeah. That's the know. thing. If I, I think I was to, to run away from him, actually sprint and climb over and just take off running. I don't know. Can you tell me that Bob Sapp has like four months to live? But that was like six years ago. What's that? You told me Bob Sapp had like four months to live, but that was like six years ago. Yeah, when I talked to him, I actually he didn't tell me that his uh, one of his best friends did. It, uh, he was having liver trouble. I guess I'm not saying that, but he's doing all right. I talked to him still about once a month. He's for all the for all the shit he catches, man. Sapp is one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my yeah. life, and a guy who would do anything for me. Like he, he's done me a couple of things. I just called him and needed a uh, hook up on something. You know, when I was in Seattle one time, like hey, uh, I was dating across Seattle. I was out there uh, in Seattle. He's actually from that area, and. Um, he hooked me up with one of his buddies out there, helped me out. Like he's uh, um, hooked me up with a chiropractor out there. I hurt my back uh, while I was out there. Bad, couldn't even get out of bed. And he sent me his guy and told his guy he would cover the bill. Like he, uh, Sap is a uh, he, he's got probably twenty employees, man. It doesn't need any of them. He just the way his uh, one of his employees told me I was talking to out there. He said that Bob just feels sorry for people, so he just hires them. You know, like uh, he met a he met a girl, I guess that was just a she was like a prostitute from the time she was twelve years old over there in Japan. And he met her someplace one time and uh, got talking to her and just felt sorry for her. And so he hired her so she didn't have to you know, be a prostitute anymore. He hired her to, like, she carries around, like, his, uh, like, just a sweat town, wipes his head off with and, like, feeds him. When the, when the, we went out to eat, you know, whatever, she just, like, feeds him his food and stuff. And it's just uh, really more or less a reason for him to uh, give her money. You know what I mean? Because he feels bad for her. But he's got, yeah, he's, he told me he had, I think, 18 to 20 people working for him. Um, Oh, at wow. any given time and he doesn't really need it he just he's got such a big heart man probably literally and figuratively but uh i hate awesome. when, i mean i know what it, i know what he was doing when he was you know he went on a streak of losing but uh he told me which it made kind of sense at the time he told me he said man if a promotion hires you like let's say in, i don't know kazakhstan or something and they have their local hero that they want to fight you and they're going to pay you forty thousand dollars to fight, but an extra forty if you lose, because they want their local guy to look good. You know, he said that's pro wrestling to me. He said, like you're telling me, what you come on, put out a show out here, you know, or whatever, and we want our guy to win. He said, of course I'm going to. He said they told me it was funny because he said they wanted him to uh, lose this guy, and he said they didn't know this. I was going to lose anyway. He said I couldn't beat that kind of fight. So <laughs> he was fighting. He said, but I told him, okay, for an extra forty. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a dive. He said, but to me at that point, that's just pro wrestling. He said, so I think I look like a million bucks, you know, I try to make him look good. And, um, I'm going to lose anyway. Anyway. he goes, that's what's the difference between that and pro wrestling. He goes, if I'm just going out there and they're paying me to the same for the promotions, paying me to lose, you know, he said, so that's, hilarious. Um, but maybe that's how he justifies it. But yeah, when he, I lost it when he said it, he goes, what they didn't know is I was going to lose for 40,000, but you just gave me 80. So. That's so funny. No, he he definitely like I told him he's the first guy to ever merge WWE and UFC uh, and MMA without really anyone knowing it. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. That was, so. that was awesome. It's uh, someone had proposed that he and I fight. One of the Japanese promoters proposed he and I fight. He said, "I'm not fighting you." And I was thinking the same thing at the time, but I didn't want to say it. I was too proud. But uh, yeah, he was yeah. like, "I'm not." He's I ain't fighting that big dude. Which he's sap is every bit my height, if not an inch taller, uh, and every bit as heavy as me, if not. 60 or 80 pounds more, but all muscle. That dude, even to this wait, day, man. Wait, Sap is your height? Not an ounce of fat on him. So. Wait, he's um, your height? Really? He do. He's, he's easy, six, 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 seven. Uh, I've got pictures of him on my Instagram. I couldn't believe it. When I saw him, I thought he'd be like, you know, Lester's like six, three. So I thought he'd be like some guy like that, but that big, but he's only six. You know, I say only, but compared to me, six, three is not that tall, you know. But when I saw him, he is, he were eye level, and he may be even a little bit taller than me. So he's, he's six, 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 seven, uh, at least, uh, which I couldn't believe it. When I, when I saw him, it was actually kind of scary. I felt like we were uh, the Beatles, except a black guy and a white guy in Japan. 
but uh, we, uh, we jumped out of the taxi, and obviously they all see him running the room, and he's a celebrity over there, and he pulls his shirt off uh, and just ripped, you know what I mean, just muscle down ripped, and um, I'm not sure when I pulled his shirt off, but everybody, 200, 300 people come running to us, all grabbing him and, you know, trying to take pictures and all this, and I was just caught in the mix. It was kind of scary for me for a minute. I felt like uh, it was World War II or something, <laughs> like, you died, G.I. <laughs> but, um, it was, I probably should have left that one out, but no, it was, uh, it was, um, yeah, we were mobbed by people or whatever, but he, uh, I asked him, how much do you weigh right now? He goes, I'm about 390, but I mean, 390 without almost any body fat at all, just completely, wow. uh, just ripped. And, uh, he, uh, did, that dude knows more about steroids than anybody you've met in your life. And I'll tell you what, he's got his, he's got his master's in pharmacology or his PhD in pharmacology, uh, literally from school. And also I think it's street pharmacology because he, uh, he can tell you anything about anything. He was the first one that told me about something called peptides that guys are using, which is a less dangerous form of H- HCH. You know, it's still legal or was legal. I don't know if it is anymore, but uh, he was telling me that, you know, like you get the same results from that. Uh, that's what uh, Chad Mendez got suspended for, I think, uh, for some kind of peptide. So although, what does, yeah, so, like, his did, was did, so what was Dillashaw taking, by the way? Like, like what does EPO do for you? What's what? EPO, EPO. What, uh, what, what yeah, the, yeah, the EPO. Um, I, I would have loved to have tried it because um, it's it's like they call it liquid cardio. Uh, the my understanding is it thickens your blood uh, to a degree, like makes it really thick uh, because it increases your red blood cell count by two to three, even four times what your red blood cell count. But you've also got a stroke and die from it just from injecting it. Um, but um, I guess the guys that know what they're doing go to a doctor or whatever. It's, you know, it's blood doping, but uh, if you're if you're you've got three times the red blood cells, your your blood can carry three times the oxygen to your muscles, I guess. Um, so that would explain like a guy like TJ that was taking it, why he never got tired in fights, because everybody I know that ever tried it told me that it literally, you know, it's what Lance Armstrong was, was the big one that Lance Armstrong was taking. Um, but they said you literally, if you get tired in eight minutes running on the treadmill, let's say ten to make an even like a more even number, in ten minutes if you get tired on the treadmill. At eight miles an hour or whatever it is that you could go 30 minutes before you're the same amount of fatigue, you know? Uh, and it lasts for, I guess, four to five days for effects do. So I think you take it and then it peaks at the third or fourth day and the last for four days, timing it right to where it was during a fight that they would be peaked you know, with the most red blood cells. But also when your blood gets thick like that, you can get clots and have strokes and stuff like that. So it's a real dangerous one, like one you can die from, you know? So, um, it's a dangerous one, but they uh, they say the cardio results. Everybody I've known that ever tried it said it is unbelievable. They're like without without any extra work or anything, all of a sudden in in three days your cardio is tripled. You know, so if you're tired wow. at the end of the first round, you're not going to be tired till the end of the third. The same amount of time, you know. So, wow. um, it uh, which would have been perfect for me because I got tired in about thirty seconds, so I could have fought for a minute and a half at least with EPO. But um, not always, not always, right? Yeah, it's uh, no, no. I mean. I, I could go, you know, I fought a couple of fights. I fought uh, one or two to the distance, actually at least twice to the distance, fought some into the second round. It's uh, I made the mistake, man, I think when I was fighting, and I made the same mistake playing basketball in college. But I didn't put the two together till later on when I wasn't fighting anymore. Is that uh, I don't think I was getting warmed up enough. Um, I always did better. Um, I, in college, I would get real tired. I'd play, you know, 38 to 40 minutes when I played college basketball, but it seemed like – the first two or three minutes of the game, I had to get pulled out. Like, tell the coach I had to come out for a second just to catch my breath, and then I would feel fine. I could play the rest of the game, you know? And uh, I wasn't, get, wasn't getting a good warm-up, I think. And I think just my body needed that, and I don't think I was doing it. And I, it's so hard in the UFC to get a good warm-up or to time your warm-up right, because unless you're the main event or the first fight of the night, you don't know when you're fighting. I mean, it could be any time within a 45-minute you know, swing, uh, depending on how fast the fight's before you go. So... It's real hard. At least they don't tell you. If they know, they don't tell you what kind of fighting. You know, you have a list. You know, a list of who's fighting when, uh, or who's fighting, but you don't know exactly when you are. So I had a lot of trouble. Like I may get really good warmed up, ready to go, and then I got to sit for forty minutes. You know, and you also don't want to burn yourself up, get a real good warm up, and then try to stay warm. You know, and uh, be ready. The only time I was able to do it in the UFC was when I fought Hunt because that was the first fight of the night, so I knew exactly I was fighting at exactly seven fifteen. So, you know, I knew right. to get uh, really. Uh, get my heart rate going, really get, you know, burned up, burn off that first, you know, bit of adrenaline and then uh, be ready to go out there. But that adrenaline dump stuff is real, man. That is, uh, I never believed in that when I used to watch UFC before I was there and before I fought, but you'll be out there. You can be in phenomenal shape in 90 seconds in, a minute or 
you know, two and a half minutes in, all of a sudden, just your legs go up, your arms just things heavy. It's like you can't just the nervousness, you know, or whatever. Like, uh, it's just rough, man. But uh, if you fight through it, it ends up you get your second win. But I mean, it can be really rough for a couple of minutes when you just feel like uh, sometimes right before the fight started, I'd be out there, I felt like my legs were going to give out, you know, like whatever, just from the. Uh, I don't know, just a rush, you know, uh, before you fight somebody. It's a, it's a hard thing to do to fight someone that you don't have a problem with, you know? Like, if it's not, especially in front of millions of people, like, to uh, go out there and fight someone that has, you have no problem with at all. You're not mad. You're not, you know, you don't have a reason you're fighting them other than for people's entertainment. For me, that was always hard to get into that mindset because I don't, uh, I don't know, I don't like, I never liked fighting. I just was kind of good at it, so. You were not kind of good at it. You were great at it. Well, listen, Sean, I want to have you on all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to be in the Saturday. I'm going to be in Seattle, but I'll be back Sunday. Let's go out Sunday night. Okay. We can do that. Are you, are you going to be at, uh, are you going to be at, uh, See, our boy's wedding? The what? No, no, I got a, I got a gig in Seattle, but I'm going to be back on Sunday morning. So let's hang out Sunday night. Okay. All right, man. That'll work. I'll, uh, I'll see you when you get back. All right. Love you, brother. Everybody, let's go see. trap, sons and trap, sons and trap, trap, sons and trap, don't trap, don't trap, don't trap. Tuni sons to hook them, don't put them. Tada, stole them, don't put them, don't put them.